Right, so uh, let's go back to where we were uh, in the previous lecture, just to re reaffirm that we are not chimps. We, we differ from chimps. Uh, all these different morphological characteristics, behavioral characteristics, but what we're here to talk about today is what can the genome tell us about how we stopped being chimps and became something else? So what can, that, what can we hope to find out from genes and genomes? Um, we can look at what kind of variation there is in global terms, you know, how much of a difference is there. We can look at different places in the genome. We can estimate the time of divergence from our closest relatives. We can look at the mode of genome evolution and the mode of speciation. And more particularly, I think this is probably the most interesting thing, we can actually look at human-specific changes in the genome and look at what differences actually make us human. And obviously, if we want to home in on what makes us human, what is distinctive, it's those changes in the brain that underlie changes in human behavior, intelligence, and so forth, and particularly the power of speech, the power of language, which is a distinctive human characteristic. As a side effect or, or spin-off, if you like, we can also perhaps shed light on human uh, diseases, genetic diseases. We can uh, actually get some idea uh, about how they work, how they've evolved, and so forth from these kind of uh, comparisons. So currently, what have we got? Well, we've got the Neanderthal genome. I'm not going to say much about that today, or anything really, because that's the next year's module. So if you like these lectures, then sign up for the equivalent uh, module next year, and then we'll deal with the Neanderthal genome. We've got the human genome, we've got chimp genome, orang genome. Uh, in fact, there's a gorilla genome as well. The orang genome is now published. The gorilla genome is, is about to be published. And, and we have the rhesus macaque genome as well. So this subject really came uh, of age with this paper, initial sequence of the chimpanzee genome and comparison with the human genome back in 2005. Uh, paper appeared in Nature. The genome was that of a single male chimpanzee called Clint, after Clint Eastwood, uh, and he gave his DNA. And you can see here, present the draft genome sequence of common chimpanzee. We uh, uh, have Look at, we can get a complete catalogue of the changes. Uh, 35 million single nucleotide changes, 5 million insertion, deletion events, and various chromosomal rearrangements. Um, and we'll go through this now in a bit more detail. So if we're looking at what makes us human, we can actually have some idea before we start. We can say, ah, oh, let's look at the chimp equivalent of this gene and see what it's like. Or we can actually look for the differences in the two genomes just in an open-ended fashion. Um, and particularly look for those changes that appear to have undergone natural selection, that have been selected for those regions that have evolved quickly, say, on the human lineage compared to the chimpanzee. But with 35 million bases of difference, of SNPs of difference, we are actually searching for a needle in a haystack here. There's a tremendous amount of noise in that genome comparison, and we're still a long way from actually pinning this down. That's a negative way of looking at it. The positive way of looking at it is that the truth is out there. We have the chimpanzee genome, we have the human genome, we just have to boil down the differences to find out what it is that makes us unique. And this, you know, I think it's quite exhilarating to think that this, we will have the answers to these kind of questions during your lifetime. Uh, as uh, research progresses, we will start to understand uh, in great detail what it is that's happened along the human lineage uh, to make us human. But, again, to return to being perhaps more um, sceptical or, or at least uh, conservative, we have to say there's no easy answer. As we mentioned in the first lecture, uh, most genetic Genetic change, evolutionary change, is actually neutral, particularly at the, at the level of nucleotides, at the level of sequences. And those adaptive changes really only constitute a very small fraction of the changes. Another thing is that the number of changes you see at the nucleotide level 
doesn't correlate particularly well with what you see when you look at the morphological level, when you look at the level of the whole organism and you do comparisons that way. Um, so if we look at a chimp and then we look at a human, we think, oh, wow, they are very, very different organisms. They're morphologically very different. Uh, but the, the differences um, that we see in mice with the same degree of DNA difference, well, we couldn't really tell the difference between those two different mouse species, uh, except perhaps with a very expert eye. Um, and if you look at dogs, any of you keep dogs, you know, you can see that they're all very variable in terms of size and shape and behaviours and all that sort of stuff. But all that variation is squeezed into a fraction of a percent of genetic variation between all those dog species. Um, so it, it's going to be hard to tease this out. So what differences do we see? Well, we, there are differences in the number of chromosomes between humans and chimps. There are changes in chromosome structure. There are lots of insertions and deletions. So there's about 90 megabase pairs of DNA, which is either human or chimp-specific when we do that comparison. We see genes getting duplicated. We see genes getting lost. And the thing that's going to be hardest to tease out, but probably is the most crucial, is that we see differences in uh, the levels of gene expression in the two different genomes, in the two different lineages. So one of the obvious things that you see uh, that was known before people actually sequenced the genomes was that there's a difference in the number of chromosomes. Uh, so we have one less autosomal chromosome than the chimpanzees. Human chromosome 2 is actually a fusion of two chimpanzee chromosomes which have to, to sort of standardise the nomenclature with regard to the human, they've been called 2A and 2B. We also have uh, the segmental uh, duplications, where bits of, the chromoso of a chromosome will just get uh, duplicated and move somewhere else. Uh, about, as it says there, about 14% of the human and 5% uh, of the chimpanzee genome. We get inversions, multiple inversions, and we get translocations where bits of uh, one chromosome break off and get shoved onto another chromosome. Um, and there's this XY translocation in the human lineage, uh, which has created a second uh, pseudo-autosomal region on the Y chromosome. In fact, when we're trying to unravel what is the main mode of evolution, of genome evolution, we, we come up with a a, a number of different overlapping possibilities. Um, and these have been given different names. So protein evolution, fairly self-evident what that means. Amino acid su substitutions. These are kind of low-hanging fruit. It's easy to spot when one amino acid turns into another amino acid in a protein. Uh, and, and also it's relatively easy to then try and tease out what that means in terms of function. You can get missense and nonsense mutations that actually uh, abrogate a gene, knock off a large part of it, and cause premature truncations and so forth. Small indels and duplications also can affect protein evolution. There's this other idea called the less is more hypothesis, which is actually that perhaps the things that led to us are deletions, that perhaps we've lost things that were in chimpanzees. And, and we mustn't blind ourselves to the idea that uh, you have to add some special magic thing to the human lineage to make humans. Maybe you just have to lose some of the things on, on, the, on this lineage compared to what's on the chimpanzee lineage or on the lineage before the divergence with chimpanzees. And then, as I mentioned before, the big thing that's the kind of elephant in the room, the thing that's going to be hardest to find, are substitutions in promoter regions which will have... Uh, subtle but important effects on gene expression um, and uh, these will lead to important phenotypic changes. Back to back with the uh, genome paper on the chimp the genome, there was this paper here which looked at recent chimpanzee and human uh, segmental duplications. Um, and just this last uh, sentence is worth stressing here, 
It says, nevertheless, base per base, large segmental duplication events have had a greater impact, 2.7%, in altering the genomic landscape of these two species than single base pair substitution, which amounts to 1.2%. So when people say, how much similarity is there between the human and the chimp genome, it, it kind of depends on what metric you're looking at. Um, and this, these duplications are actually seem to be a large part of that landscape uh, there. Now, if we try and analyze uh, the differences in gene expression, um, we, this can take us some way to trying to understand the differences between humans and chimps. But it's quite a hard ask. This is a paper where they tried this difficult question. What they did was they just looked at what genes were expressed in the brain, uh, in segments of the brain, um, and they actually were able to show that humans and chimpanzees formed a sister group. This is not projecting particularly well, but this is chimpanzee, this is human, this is gorilla here, um, and, and I think that's macaque out, out there. So if you just look at what genes are expressed in the brain, you can see this similarity between humans and chimpanzees. Now that's not what we're, you know, primarily we're interested in the differences, but it's kind of interesting to see that you can actually get some, make some kind of sense out of these gene expression profiles in that way. Um, and here's another paper that says more or less the same thing, that basically we're looking for very quite subtle differences when you look at gene expression. You, you kind of think the old view would be, well, obviously it's going to be massively different because humans are massively different from chimps. But in fact, when we look at uh, the gene expression networks and co-expression networks in humans and chimps, we don't see a huge amount of difference. Here's one um, difference that was highlighted in this particular paper that you can actually look at uh, regions of the genome that are varying uh, in, in gene expression. Um, and this then allows you to home in on per certain parts of the genome for further investigation. This, is, this kind of research is still a, in, in its infancy, and we don't have a great deal of, of understanding of these differences, but nonetheless they are starting to be delineated. Now, getting back to the genome comparisons at the nucleotide level, I mentioned the low-hanging fruit. The easiest thing to kind of conceptualize and understand are those differences that are happening in terms of single nucleotide substitutions in protein coding ge uh, genes. Um, and if we look at uh, proteins from you and a chimpanzee, we find that on average a protein in you differs from the same protein in the chimpanzee by just two amino acids. Uh, and again, worth stressing, it doesn't mean that you've got th those two amino acid changes have accumulated in our lineage. One of them has accumulated on our lineage since the divergence from the common ancestor. One has uh, arisen in the um, chimpanzee lineage. But between a quarter and a third of all the proteins uh, expressed out of the human genome and the chimp genome are, in fact, identical at the amino acid level. Uh, so uh, really a, a, a quite stark reminder of quite how similar that we are to chimpanzees at the molecular level. There are differences in the kind of mobile parts of the genome. So our genomes are littered with these so-called endogenous retroviruses. So things like HIV in years gone by that have invaded the, the human genome, uh, proliferated in there. We have this so-called HERV-K uh, endogenous re retrovirus in chimps, they have these two different endogenous retrovirus lineages, PT of 1 and 2. There are also these things called allu repeats, which you've probably heard about. Uh, these are much more common in the human genome than they are in the chimpanzee genome, and there are obviously differences uh, in the distribution of those allu repeats in the two different lineages. As we mentioned, there was this change also in the uh, Y chromosome with this uh, acquisition of a second pseudo-orthosomal region. Uh, this paper here uh, points up that actually the Y chromosome seems to have diverged very quickly. Uh, and the, so it's by comparing the, the, these uh, male-specific regions of the Y chromosome, the bits that aren't the pseudo-orthosomal, uh, there's a lot of rapid evolution 
the, the chimpanzee region contains twice as many massive palindromes as the human uh, region, but it's lost large families of, of uh, protein coding genes. Uh, so this is one area where there has been a lot of difference between. So if you look at these dot plots here, what this is showing you is showing you positions in the human genome, positions in the chimpanzee genome, where there is a, uh, where the similarity crosses a certain threshold, uh, you get a, a point on the line. And you can see if you compare chromosome 21, human and chimpanzee, they're collinear all the way along. It's very easy to line them up. You compare human and chimpanzee Y chromosome, and you get the bits of cross-hatching here and there, but, but no linear, long linear diagonal. Uh, basically, th what this uh, shows is that there's been lots of duplications and rearrangements uh, in that particular region. There are differences in the biology that we can tease out from looking at the genomes. Um, Caspase 12 is disrupted in humans. It's intact in mice and chimps. Uh, so that's one important difference in cell biology, if you like, between us uh, and these other animals. It's been speculated that that might underlie human susceptibility to Alzheimer's, although that's still speculative at the moment. In terms of inflammation, there are a number of um, cytokines, uh, interleukins and so forth, that are all missing in chimps. You can see them there, IL-1F7, IL-1F8, and iceberg. These are all missing in chimps. Um, there are some, disease, uh, some genes involved in parasite resistance, which are missing in chimps, and it's been suggested that perhaps those account for altered uh, resistances to trypanosomes. Uh, and there are differences in silic acid biology as well. Uh, there's particularly this gene, CMAH. And it's thought that this may underlie differences <coughs> in susceptibility to malaria and AIDS. So that just r reminds me to make a point which I hadn't made before, which is that another reason for studying the human chimpanzee genomes, and trying to tease this out, is that we do have different susceptibilities to diseases. Um, and... Um, working out why humans get a particular infection and chimps don't, or vice versa, can actually lead us to a better understanding of how diseases are caused. <coughs> now, one strange thing, uh, unexpected thing that, that turned up when they looked at the chimpanzee genome was what they found was that the chimpanzee allele, a variant of a particular, of a particular gene, which was... Uh, in many cases, thought to uh, represent the, the, the ancestral state in you know, before humans and chimpanzees. So goes, that actually mapped onto what is in modern humans a disease state, uh, which seems a bit odd. Um, so there are these these various variants here, which have been these are the diseases they've been associated with, <coughs> showing that they have uh, individuals with that particular change have an increased risk of this particular disease, um, and what you find is that the chimp has what appears to be a disease version of that allele. Uh, and in some cases, you can work out that this is, is this the wild type, it's the ancestral form. Um, uh, what we're seeing in chimps, uh, or are we looking at the, 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 the chimp actually have a disease form, which is a derived form? Uh, and that can all be teased out. This is, strange, this is a strange phenomenon. It wasn't expected, I don't think, and it, it it requires a bit of explanation. It means that if we rather reductively look at genetic diseases and say, oh, it's going to be a change in that gene there, in that particular nucleotide there that causes the disease, how do you then explain this? It must be that there are subtle changes in the whole network of interacting proteins and pathways and so forth that can mitigate the effects of what appears to be a disease variant in humans. Now on to some of the candidate genes, the ones that were all the headlines. FOXP2 is probably the front runner here in terms of, of, of human interest, scientific interest. This actually was identified not through the, through the, 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 the chimpanzee genome, but uh, through genetics, conventional genetics. It was, it's uh, identified as the site of a Mendelian dominant mutation in a particular family known as KE, the KE family. In this family, they had difficulties with speech. And it was noticed that this, was, this affliction was 
uh, being transmitted in what appeared to be a Mendelian, uh, uh, Mendelian fashion. Um, and this was tied down to a particular missense mutation in, the, in what's known as the forkhead domain of FOXP2. Uh, and this co-segregated with the disorder in the family. So what is FOXP2? Well, it's a regulatory protein. It contains what's known as a forkhead domain. Um, and it actually regulates a large number, you know, through a cascade, regulates hundreds of genes in the brain, uh, including that one that there, CNTNAP2, which is another important uh, you know, potential variant between humans and chimps. Now, FOXP2, is, is often, if you go to the tabloid newspapers, or even to the broadsheet, it gets named the language gene. Uh, but it's, it's also involved in motor coordination. So to imagine, imagine what's involved in speaking, it's not just doing things in your brain to actually create the words and the semantics and the, uh, and the syntax. It's also lots of mo a very fine motor coordination of your vocal tract, of your tongue, uh, getting all those things right <coughs> as well. And these individuals who were afflicted with this particular mutation, they had anomalies in the basal ganglia. Uh, um, and embryological studies showed that in humans and in, in mice, this FOXB2 actually modulates uh, development of the basal gang ganglia. And it's now thought that FOXB2 is also involved in bird song and in bat echolocation. So there's this kind of it seems to have been recruited into these very fine um, production of sounds, but using lots of very fine motor coordination as well. Now, the interesting thing was that when people looked at the, uh, the, the sequence of this of the gene underlying FOXP2 in uh, humans, in chimps, gorillas, orangutans, rhesus monkeys, mice, in fact, if you look through lots of different animals, you actually see a particular striking change. So on this chart here, what we have before, uh, we have two numbers. And the first number on each lineage there is the number of substitutions which change in amino acid in, in that particular branch. And after the slash there is the number of changes uh, in the gene which don't alter an amino acid, which is silent change. <coughs> And what we see is that, yeah, you get uh, silent changes are occurring over time. Uh, they are kind of neutral. We're thought to be neutral, so that they're thought to accumulate roughly in a clock-like fashion. So if we look at the mouse lineage compared to the others, we've got lots and lots and lots of substitutions, 131 of those silent substitutions. But if we look at all the other lineages, apart, from, and the mouse has got one. So we in mice... I don't know where we go back, 200 million years to the common ancestor. So one change on the mouse lineage. If we look at these other lineages here, Lepidoresus, orangs, gorillas, chimps, we see no changes in the coding sequence, a variable number of silent changes, but we see in the human lineage two amino acid changes. Now that might not seem like much, but actually it's, it sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. That, that is a, a, a large degree of change. Uh, in the human lineage in terms of actual coding sequence changes uh, encoding changes than uh, what we'd expect. So, the scientists being scientists naturally curious have followed this up in mice uh, trying to understand what this gene does. So they've made knockout mice. If you knock out uh, the gene, you get severe developmental delays, you get defects in ultrasonic communication. So mice, when they're born, they start squeaking to their mother and she squeaks back in ultrasonic uh, frequencies. And there are defects in that kind of communication. In fact, um, the uh, defects are so severe that if you have a, a homozygous, I think they're actually lethal in the, in, in the womb. A heterozygous, you do get uh, that they can survive, but they do have these defects. So then what people have tried to do is they... They said, well, let's make a knockout, let's make, let's make a change, not a knockout, let's make a change in the mouse that corresponds to the change we see in that human family with the language difficulty, this R553H, a knock-in mouse. And again, they find that they have these same 
severe developmental problems of defects in ultrasonic communication. And then they did probably the most uh, bold and daring experiment. They actually put the human FOXP2 into mice. Uh, those mi mice turned out to be generally healthy. I think there were these concerns that if the, if the mice started sort of, you know, looking that they were turning into Mickey Mouse and get up and start speaking, they had to immediately terminate the experiment. <coughs> serious. They actually did have to think about the ethics of what they were doing. But they found that the, there were differences in these ultrasonic vocalizations, so the decreased exploratory behavior, decreased dopamine concentrations in the brain, various increases in, in terms of the cellular side of things, dendrite den den lengths go up, synaptic plasticity is increased. So clearly, if you put the human gene and shove it into the mouse, it does have an effect. Uh, and so this idea that those two changes stick out like a sore thumb is actually being borne out by these studies. We still don't, you know, we have to be cautious interpreting these changes. Is that, you know, looking at this back on the back of what I said about uh, the, the chimp alleles looking like disease alleles, uh, there's going to be all sorts of other changes in the networks of genes <coughs> regulated by these, uh, by FOXP2 in mice and humans, and so we have to be careful in generalizing. But nonetheless, this is all pointing towards FOXP2 actually being a very important gene in human evolution. Another uh, genetic region uh, that's been uh, identified in these studies has been given the name HAR1, the Human Accelerated Region 1. So again, if we do the same kinds of comparisons, we compare a chicken with a chimp, we see that there are just two substitutions in 118 bases in this region. If we compare chimp and human, we find 18. Now this is not a protein coding gene. It appears to produce uh, an RNA, uh, which is expressed during cortical development. Um, and we have no idea what it's doing, what type of uh, things it's regulating, uh, what, how it's having any phenotype, if any. But the fact that its, acceler its, its evolution has been so accelerated is extremely suspicious. One possible clue comes from this paper, which was published a short while after the previous one, where they actually looked at the secondary structure of the RNA that was produced by uh, the transcript from this region. Um, and they found that there were actually very significant differences in the uh, secondary structure when you compared the human and the chimp version uh, of this particular molecule, uh, uh, such that might actually have uh, profound downstream effects on phenotype. But again, we still have really very little clue as to, no clue as to what this is doing. So Hello? So going back to this, you mean, so here, the first number is, is changes that actually lead to an amino, one amino acid changing into another. The second number are the changes that are silent. So if we have, say, an amino acid glycine, we have G, G, and then we can have A, C, T, or G. It doesn't matter. So changing an, a G, G, A to G, G, T is the kind of silent mutation we're talking about. Uh, and that is what was un, un, well, that was what's surprising here. Obviously, you can only look at that kind of variation in protein coding genes. When we're looking at this gene, the HAR1, we don't have uh, such a, an obvious handle on what's going on because this is not coding for proteins. Um, but a, a sort of similar thing, a kind of phenotypic readout here, is looking at the folding and seeing what's happening there. <coughs> Amylase is another important uh, gene that seems to have undergone uh, uh, significant evolution in the human lineage, not so much in its sequence, but in copy number. So there are multiple copies of amylase in, in mammalian genomes, but we seem to have more, many more, than most other mammals. Um, and in fact, there's variation within, among humans, and there is a correlation between the, the copy number of, of amylase genes in your genome and the amount of amylase you actually produce in your saliva. So I guess probably most of you watched Alice Roberts. Did you watch her spitting into a tube the other week and showing this? She actually showed this difference uh, in a way that was very um, compelling and very straightforward and simple. Just 
did an amylase test on human saliva and chimpanzee saliva and showed that, yes, you could actually detect more amylase in her saliva than in a chimpanzee. Uh, and this is as a result of uh, changes in the copy number of this gene AMI1. Um, and people with high starch diets tend to have more AMI1 copies than those low starch diets. So what is this, even, what, what, what is this about? Uh, Alice Roberts said, well, it's to do with the fact that we ate tubers during our evolution, cooked tubers, and that was part of what made us human, gave us access to different kinds of diet. But that still doesn't, act, uh, understand, uh, doesn't explain why, why do we have it in the saliva. And some ideas that have been put uh, out is, well, if, if you're turning starch into glucose in, in the mouth, it can be absorbed from the oral mucosa. Uh, and so maybe you can get more calories from the diet more quickly, and which will be a particular issue, say, if you had uh, gastrointestinal upset, you was, uh, vomiting, or had diarrhea. But again, that's speculation. Maybe it is just simply that it, it's an easier way of getting uh, uh, glucose out of starch in, in any case. There are a couple of genes, so-called brain-building genes, that have been uh, uh, also uh, in, the, in, the, in the limelight in the last few years. There's one called ASPM and another one called microcephalin. These have been identified in patients who have very small heads, very small brains, they have a genetic disorder, um, and there are a whole <coughs> range of other uh, uh, such genes that have been identified. Uh, ASPM has been shown to be crucial for the control of cell division in neuroepithelial cells, and they both appear to have experienced bursts of changes during primate evolution, including in our lineage since we diverged from the chimp lineage. Now, science sometimes erupts in controversy, and this happened uh, a few years ago, back in 2005, uh, when this guy here, Bruce Lahn, published uh, a couple of papers saying that these genes were actually continuing to evolve in humans, and that the, there were variants outside of Africa uh, that seem to be quite recent, and there's ongoing evolution in these genes outside of Africa. Now, unfortunately, because the kind of racist undertones in our society, this was interpreted to mean, oh, that's what makes people outside of Africa smarter than people in Africa. Uh, that was the glib view that was taken, uh, you know, the kind of Daily Mail interpretation of these findings. It did create quite a lot of controversy at the time, uh, but... Subsequent studies actually show that, in fact, there was, there's no link between these va variants in, say, microcephalin uh, and IQ or brain size. And these aren't just brain genes. These genes are expressed outside the brain as well. Um, and other uh, scientists commented on this and said, well, actually, you could be just tracking the out-of-Africa migration. These are just this kind of doesn't actually um, make any... Uh, big prediction, it's not particularly unusual, you get these variations in other genes as well, um, and so the whole thing kind of died down. But it, it gives you a feeling for how inflammatory and difficult this kind of area of research can be, uh, particularly if people make discoveries which get overinterpreted or which actually don't go with, with what uh, the public want, wants to hear. This is a very strange uh, finding here that the uh, if you look at these, these particular uh, genes, you, these, these high half the groups, you find there are correlations with the kind of languages that people speak. And if they have tonal languages, uh, like Chinese, that they would have uh, a particular haplotype and not another. Whether this is purely spurious or whether it has any meaning is, is yet to be told, but it's a kind of interesting correlation that was found. Myosin uh, is another source of, of differences between humans, our, our musculature is different. It says here, powerful jaw muscles are found in most primates, including gorillas and chimpanzees. We look at some of, our, of the um, fossils from the human lineage, since divergence from the chimpanzee, Australopithecus, Paranthropus. These uh, also have these huge, great uh, masticatory muscles, but they're much smaller in, uh, in humans. 
Um, and they're saying, well, what is the possibility? Or how, can, how can we actually um, explain this? And they say there has been a frame shift um, mutation in one particular myosin uh, heavy chain expressed in these muscles uh, that occurred after uh, the divergence of chimpanzees. Oh dear, I better plug in some power. I thought I might get away with it. Um, two seconds of delay while I find a plug. So again, this has been put forward as uh, a, an important difference between us and chimpanzees that we can tie down to a particular gene. The problem is that many of these things are just single reports and, and we, you know, how do we actually test this hypothesis? How do we actually take this forward and show that this really is the case? Um, sometimes the term just so stories is applied to these kind of evolutionary narratives that people thread over the data. Uh, and I think we'll have to wait a few more years before this subject is mature enough for us to be able to say, yes, that is now unquestioned or that actually that's what people used to think but it's no longer true. Um, and let's, I think I'll skip that bit there. Uh, here's a, um, another example, Car uh, gene, uh, genes involved in, in the hair. Uh, the, the, um, we have this gene that's involved in the formation of hair that's inactivated in the human lineage. Uh, it's a bit of what we call a pseudogene in the human lineage. Um, and... Uh, this may, it, again, it's one of those things that, that, that is said may account for the differences between us and chimpanzees this time in the length of our hair and distribution of our hair. And in fact, um, it, the same gene has actually been targeted in comparisons between uh, woolly mammoths, which are covered in hair, and modern elephants, which are not covered in hair. Um, so it's turning up an interesting parallel there. Again, I tend to think that these things, well, we'll see how things uh, pan out. It, uh, it, it's difficult to take these things uh, too seriously in isolation. Another gene that's been mentioned, nearly finished on these candidate genes, this is just a bit of a list, but uh, that's the way we're at the moment. This is HAR2, Human Accelerated Region 2, otherwise known as HACNS1. This appears to be uh, a gene involved in the development of the hand in particular, um, and uh, and, and, the, uh, and it's thought that the, um, the changes in this particular gene might have actually uh, underpinned um, the uh, development of the thumb, uh, the opposable thumb that we have and that chimpanzees lack and in terms of giving us the dexterity and so forth. Okay, last uh, few minutes of this lecture, we... Now turn to uh, one more genome, came out a, a, a couple of years after the chimp genome, and that was the rhesus macaque. Now you might say, well, you know, why are we interested in some kind of monkey like this? Uh, it's clear that chimps are our closest relative, so why are we bothering with others? Well, uh, the reason is that this actually gives us some kind of triangulation, if you like. Uh, so we can look at... Um, the human chimp ancestor, that's six million years ago. But how do we reconstruct what that looked like? Because we don't know whether the changes since that ancestor occurred on our lineage or the chimpanzee lineage. If we had this additional uh, rhesus macaque uh, ancestor, uh, what lineage, sorry, we can then start to reconstruct an older ancestor 25 million years ago when we diverged our lineage and together that lineage <coughs> diverged from the macaque. And this gives us uh, a, a way of working out which changes were <laughs> which, which uh, states were ancestral in the uh, primate lineage and which changes were actually um, derived in, on one lineage or another lineage. Now, when we look at the, the rhesus macaque, we get that strange, puzzling thing that we saw with the chimpanzee genome as well, which is that Actually, we get lots of human mutations that cause inherited disease in humans, but they match an ancestral or non-human primate state. Uh, so here, here are a few of those listed here. Uh, again, what, what is uh, actually going on here? 
is this um, we're seeing uh, changes in the gene networks, uh, protein networks, interaction networks to compensate for this. Have we been too reductionist in our view? There are lots of puzzles here for geneticists to work out. If they want to understand these diseases, they've got to explain this phenomenon. Here are a, a list, the top 40, and you can make a list of genes that have undergone positive selection. And here's a list of genes that have undergone positive selection in primates. Uh, you can see, you, you kind of think, well, it'll all be to do with the brain, won't it? Well, if you look at the list, it doesn't seem quite that simple. Keratin-associated pr uh, protein, leukocyte immunoglobulin-like receptor, uh, melanoma antigen family. There's all sorts of things that have changed in, our, in the primate lineage. And understanding what the significance is of all those changes in terms of cell biology, effects on tissues and organs and so forth, this is going to take scientists a very long time to actually work out. <coughs> and so I finished. Um, we've looked at the chimpanzee genome. There are differences of many sorts from, between the chimpanzee genome and ours, ranging from SNPs to quite gross changes in chromosome structure, and in fact even changes in chromosome number, some key differences in biology. We've noticed that the chimp allele is a disease allele in humans in several genes, We've had a quick whistle-stop tour of some candidate genes, and then we've briefly, very briefly, looked at the macaque genome.